Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to this discussion uh, here at Chatham House on the changing role of uh, news media in an increasingly polarised uh, and digital world. Uh, the central question is, uh, does, does the idea of the, uh, the fourth estate, can it still provide... Uh, independent checks and balances on, on political power in democracies, does that idea still hold? Or is it being eclipsed by the changing, uh, the, the, the extraordinary changes we see in society and technology? Uh, so sort of three thoughts. Firstly, uh, the ability now that politicians like Donald Trump, for example, have to talk directly to voters and supporters through these new channels. Uh, how's that changing things? Secondly, we're seeing the emergence of partisan news organisations that are increasingly aligned with politicians and political parties rather than uh, clinging on to the idea of, of independence, so represented by Breitbart on our panel today. And thirdly, um, I guess there's the ability of the internet itself and social media that now gives almost any of us the chance to, uh, to publish and share our opinions uh, and it can go around the world in, in seconds. So how do, how do these three things affect that sort of age-old idea about the fourth estate? Um, and I suppose there's also an underlying subtext to all this in, in the sort of fear that the developments we're seeing taken together are sort of polluting in some way our information ecosystem. Uh, so I'm wary of uh, bringing up at this stage of the evening the term fake news or so-called fake news. Um, but, uh, you know, is it possible that ordinary citizens and voters in some sense are being overwhelmed by, by the noise that is out there and in the process... Uh, news media's identity itself is in some way being subsumed. So I should introduce myself first of all. Uh, I'm Nick Newman from the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at Oxford University. So I'm the author of uh, an annual report called the Digital News Report, uh, which looks or tries to look at these things empirically. Um, and so this year we're looking at across 36 countries. We're dealing with some of these issues around polarisation, trust, uh, and, and fake news, the rise of partisan sites uh, in the US and also Europe, which we have represented on the panel today. So I suppose my role uh, tonight is, uh, number one, to inject a few facts into the conversation, uh, though I know this is... Uh, <laughs> the snorting has begun, not terribly uh, fashionable these days. So I'm just going to do two facts. So firstly, uh, this may go downhill afterwards. And people may have alternatives to these, but anyway. Um, so firstly, I can tell you that uh, around 40% of people in the UK now use social media as a source of news. So this is, you know, this is, these are environments where mainstream media and other news is kind of floating around in this much more fluid way. Uh, in the US, by the way, that figure is much higher, so it's around half of, of, of people in the US are accessing news via social media every week. And the second statistic is... Um, is around how many, what percentage of people in social media or what percentage of people are following politicians or political parties directly. And in the UK, that figure's around uh, 15%, but in the US, uh, about double that, so, so much, much higher again. So not all these, uh, these systems are the same and not all the dynamics are the same. Uh, so facts was one part of my role. The second part of my role... Uh, is to introduce uh, our excellent and distinguished and international panel, uh, panellists, uh, where I'm sure we'll have no shortage of opinion uh, already half expressed on these questions. And I'm sure some facts or alternative facts may also be shared. Uh, so uh, from left to right, we have uh, Seul Chan, who's international news editor for The New York Times, uh, and a distinguished career has also worked at The Washington Post and The Wall Street Journal. Uh, next, we have Tommy Evans, who's vice president and London bureau chief for CNN. He's been here for about six years, but previously a uh, distinguished foreign correspondent leading the Baghdad Bureau, uh, amongst other things, and of course part of the liberal media or liberal conspiracy, depending on where you're coming from. Uh, then we have uh, Marie Leconte, who is uh, originally a French journalist, uh, but working in London for BuzzFeed UK, uh, covering politics and media, uh, and previously worked at The Standard and The Telegraph, amongst others. Uh, next, we have Peter Hitchens, uh, journalist and author, currently with The Mail on Sunday, a long and distinguished career with many uh, Fleet Street newspapers and also international experience, uh, spending a long time in Washington, so we'll, I'm sure, have things to say around that. And then finally, uh, to the far right, appropriately, um, <laughs> James Delimpole. How do we do that? Uh, who is author and columnist uh, with Breitbart uh, here in London, also for, for The Spectator. So, <laughs> so um, 
Uh, in terms of the format for tonight, I should just tell you, um, we're going to ask each of our speakers to say a few introductory uh, remarks to sort of address the issues uh, and headline questions of today's panel. Uh, they'll take a few minutes doing that, and then we'll sort of pick up with a bit of a discussion uh, amongst ourselves about some of these issues. And then I'm going to throw it open uh, to you. Uh, a reminder that this is, uh, although this is Chatham House, there is no Chatham House rule. I'm told it's Chatham House rule. Uh, uh, so the event is absolutely on the record. We would encourage you to tweet, to post to Facebook, your favorite social network, uh, using the hashtag, uh, hashtag CH event, hashtag CH event. And I would also ask you, if you haven't already, actually, I'm not sure I have, uh, to put your phones on silent right now. I'll do it in a minute um, to avoid unnecessary interruptions. Uh, okay, so uh, let's, uh, let's head to the panel, and uh, I'm going to ask Sewell first to um, just open with a few thoughts on, on some of these themes. Thanks, thanks, Nick, and thanks to everyone here. Is there an echo, or is, does this sound okay? I'm really honored to be here. Um, the headline question is, does the fourth estate still matter? Posed as a binary question, uh, yes or no, my answer would be yes, of course. It does, it has, it will. Um, it faces a tremendous amount of pressure. I think we need to more clearly elaborate what the fourth estate is. But before I do that, I want to um, Nick, I want to address the three phenomena that Nick mentioned, because I think two of them are actually not new, or is not as new as we have made them out to be, perhaps. And one of them is new. I think the ability or desire of leaders to kind of bypass the press as intermediary institutions and speak directly to the voters, to the people, is as old as democracy itself. I think the press, the existence of a partisan and ideological press is also a phenomenon as old as the printed word itself. Um, the nature of the partisanship has changed, of course. It's shifted over time. But in the US context, we have to remember that the early republic was filled with really vicious allegations of all sorts of you know, misconduct and all sorts of you know, mudslinging. That's not that new. In a sense, what is new in the US was this post-war ideal of kind of an objective, professionalized, uh, neutral press that was based intensely on, fact, on factual verification, on accuracy and precision of informing um, voters and citizenry, and certainly after Watergate, a very high-minded civic responsibility. In a sense, that's what was new and what, was going, and what it perhaps now is going away and reverting to an older form of partisanship. That's the second point uh, Nick raised. Nick finally raised what I think is new, which is the ability of all of us to be kind of content providers, right? Any of us can become jokesters, uh, orators, speech writers, you know, pr 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 uh, providers of information. Not all of us, in fact, nearly all of us will fail at getting an audience, but certainly a small number of amateurs uh, through either their humor, their personality, their charisma, et cetera, will succeed. Arguably, one of those people is now president of the United States. So the question, I mean, the question I would pose, to go back to the question of what is the fourth estate, if the fourth estate or if journalism is defined as the set of mainstream journalism organizations that have kind of existed and to assume their institutional continuity forever, of course, that seems really misguided at this point. Those institutions we know are facing tremendous challenges, including the one I work for and revere. The challenges are economic the balance between, in our case, subscriptions as a source of revenue, i.e. our readers, our audience, versus our advertisers. Um, that balance has shifted strongly in favor of a subscription-based model rather than an advertising one. The technological challenge, which in our case means uh, relatively fewer people reading the print edition, although ours remains very robust, very vibrant, but obviously the, not only the digital transition, but now the transition to mobile, but I would argue that because this is not a panel about the economics or the technology, I want to focus on a third challenge, which is the challenge to the fourth estate and to journalism itself in terms of journalistic practices. I'm a firm believer that journalism organizations are not the only entities that perform journalism. Journalism in the sense of the gathering and presentation 
of factual information that can be verified can actually be practiced by amateurs. We are not a professionalized body. There's no bar association for journalists. I know it's a little bit different across countries, and there is kind of a self-regulatory body here in the US. But leaving that aside, we're not like doctors. You can't really easily sue us for journalism malpractice. That doesn't mean journalism malpractice doesn't exist. It arguably is becoming more common than ever. But I think the challenge right now is, in addition to defending the institutions of journalism, which we can talk about, I think the more important challenge is defending the journalistic ethos itself. How do we preserve the principles, the values, the importance of journalism in our democracy in an age when truth itself seems to be under assault? I think that's the existential question. Thank you, and thank you for being uh, being brief. So we'll come back to some of those those issues around. I think some interesting things about sort of differences between countries, which maybe we'll explore a little bit. But also, um, you know, the idea of the journalist ethos and what needs to be protected in this sort of new world. Uh, let's let's move down the the line, so to speak, um, and pick up with with Tommy uh, from CNN. Your your thoughts on this question? You saying you were unprepared. That was that was yeah. pretty prepared. Um, <laughs> I've had most of my talking points too, which is makes me feel all right. Um, a little overlap's good. Uh, just to, to build on, on one of the points you said, um, I do think you know, what is, we really do have to address what the fourth estate is and what is the mainstream media. And I, I would argue, and I think maybe other people disagree, but I'd argue if you're, if you're a website, even a very opinionated one on the, on the right or the left, and you're going to White House press briefings and you have global reach, and you have podcasts on, for sale on iTunes, you're mainstream. And it doesn't matter if you say, if you, you know, take shots at the New York Times or CNN, you're as mainstream these days as we are. The, the, the environment has changed. Um, I am not particularly, one well, of people afraid of the new media environment. I think it's not the death of the old media because there's this new media. I think we need to ad adapt and change with it. But I think it's actually very, exciting time for journalism. I, I think there, there's been very few times in, in modern history where it's been as important as now. There is so much information out there. There's so much static. There is you know, the, the, this phenomenon of fake news, which, which I would say there's, there's at least two different kinds. You have things. Well, the two main, only, the probably, I'm sure there's more than two. The two main kinds, I would say, is one is just a uh, news that has just been blatantly fabricated to, to push one agenda or another, and it, it shows up in your Facebook feed, and there, there are ones from the right, and there are ones from the left, and, and some of them are being produced in, in you know, warehouses in Macedonia. And then there's, then there's new fake news that, that um, is news that people don't like, and it's become a, a way to bat away an opinion that they don't like. And that's what I think the biggest problem we face right now is, is this echo chamber. The left is speaking to the left, the right is speaking to the right. You, people are only going to audiences that agree with them. With, with them. Um, people who say they're challenging the status quo, if you're only talking to people who agree with you, nothing changes. That's, that's, that is actually supporting the status quo. Um, and I think that's at inherently one of the biggest risks we face now, is that we're not having, even though it's, we're talking past each other, there's never been a time before that we could communicate in such a global way for people with differing opinions, and we're not speaking to each other. And I think that's what we need to address and work on. Um, going back to, to one of the other points that, uh, about politicians using social media, I, and I, I might be wrong, and I might be in a, a minority. I think Donald Trump's use of Twitter getting him elected is, is sort of has been overstated. You know, there's a recent study saying 25% 25, 25 of all of his Twitter followers are bots. They're not even real people. Um, and, so, and, he, and frankly, a lot of people following him had very firm opinions of him. They were either massive fans, and they were voting for him anyways, or they absolutely despised him, and they just wanted to read his Twitter feed to get angry. The people, the people <laughs> who mattered, the people whose vote changed, were the ones watching the media coverage of his Twitter feed. And it was that media coverage and incessant, and, and, and I think my network was, is just as at fault as anybody else. We covered every tweet he put out. And that's where it had an impact on the voters, was the media coverage of his Twitter feed. Um, that they, yeah, I, I think I've lost my train of thought there. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I mean, one of your points there is that mainstream media is essentially, even in the stage of social media, mm. uh, is still incredibly important as an amplifier yeah. of, of, of what's going on. Uh, absolutely. Oh, and, and if you look at the, 
you know, it wasn't, I, another thing to go back to, I don't think Trump, Twitter is his, his, his savior. He, it worked very well during the campaign. I would argue it worked considerably less well during the presidency. Um, it's, a, it's a living record of his opinion, which no other president has ever had. You know, no other, and I'm not defending anyone, I think, but the truth is, there's never another a president who could make a statement of policy on Syria, for example, and instantly you can bring up what he thought about that last year, two years, three years ago. Is that fair? I don't know. People's opinions change. Fair enough. Question but is it, is it any use? Is it any use? Yeah. But it, you know, it, it, I think it's it it frustrates, especially in the Syria thing. It, I think it frustrates some of his supporters who who really didn't want American intervention in Syria. And it sort of gave ammo to his critics because they say, "Look, you fl flip flopped on it." So it's Twitter. You know, you live by the Twitter sword, you can die by the Twitter sword. I think. Okay, so that's another thing that's definitely new about the new environment: uh, the way in which a president can just lay out uh, in 140 characters what's going on. Okay, let, let, let's um, let's move on and, and um, hear a perspective, uh, a French perspective around uh, you know what's going on in the, the the French elections for Marie. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm mostly going to be talking about the French election, partly because I think it's been really fascinating and also is quite relevant to what mm. we're talking about and also because I've been struggling to talk about anything else for the past few weeks. Um, but so, I mean, it has been really unpredictable just as a quick sort of like, you know, um, background. So obviously we thought that Hollande would stand again and then he didn't. Then we had primaries for the two main parties and neither ended up with the candidate we expected to win. So that started like this. And then obviously, so like Macron came out pretty much out of nowhere and is now the most likely candidate to actually win the presidency. But I think so, like, the single big, biggest event was Fillon Gate. So we went from François Fillon, who was the centre-right candidate, we thought he was going to win, and then um, this newspaper, Le Canard Enchaîné, came out with what we now call Penelope Gate, which was that you know he had been employing his wife as a parliamentary assistant for, I can't remember, it's now turned out to be 27 years, I think. Um, you know, and she's not done any work whatsoever. And so that came out. And then, you know, like, I, I'm not going to do it because that would take about 10 minutes. But, you know, like, they came out week in, week out for months with, like, more stories on his background and everything. And he's now third and occasionally fourth in the polls. Um, he basically doesn't have a chance of winning anymore. And I think that at least the message we've had from France, like, you know, to the rest of um, the media, I guess, um, is that actually, you know, like, things may have changed a lot. But if you still have a great story, it will have impact. And, you know, Le Canard Enchaîné doesn't have a website. It comes out every week. Like, there's no website, nothing. You do have to buy it. I've got a subscription here in London. Um, and so, yeah, so that, you know, it's as old school as it gets. And it's still completely changed the way the election is going in the way no other media has managed to. Um, so I think that's that. But the counterpoint to it is that um, another person who has had allegations of um, you know, fake jobs and a lot of general dodgy stuff has been Rain Le Pen. So she was like, I think she hired someone. And so someone who was paid by you know, public money, 31,000 euro, the only proof they could find of his work was one text he sent to his supposed boss, um, which is very expensive text. Um, but anyway, you know, and, and it was been interesting. Her polls have not moved at all, so she's had nearly the same amount of like sort of like, scandalous stuff coming out against her. While Fillon completely tanked, she's pretty much at the same level of support. So I think that while the traditional media can still carry like a lot of importance, it very much depends on who's the target, because obviously, like, Le Pen voters are going to be the ones who are kind of disillusioned with the media and with the establishment in general. And so, you know, they're probably like, well, you know, why should we trust the media? Why should we care that, you know, she stole EU money because we don't like the EU anyway? Um, and, I, yeah, so I think that's um, the thing. And also, I think what's been worrying is that Fionn has adopted sort of, like, very Trumpian rhetoric where he's done, you know, sort of like slightly odd um, press conferences where he was essentially like, well, you know, I don't need the media anyway. I can win this without you people. Like, you know, it's fine. I'm going to do it. And was caught, I think, in private saying, you know, like, I don't understand why all these journalists give a shit. You know, they'll see when I win. They'll see. So, um, but, you know, but again, that the only thing that's done, at least so far in France, is just, you know, him tanking in the polls. It's not had the Trump effect at all of people going, oh, you know, he's standing up for himself. He's attacking the media, and that's a good thing. Um, and then, hang on, sorry, messy notes. Um, but yes, and the other, on the other side, because I think that's not just been from the far right. On the far left, we've had the Mélenchon surge recently, which has been the latest surprise. So far left politician who has now been trying to run for ages never really gets anywhere near the presidency and is now actually, may actually make it to the runoff into the second round. Now, we're not sure yet, but you know, he's been going up in the polls 
And partly, I think, is because his his campaign, his online campaign, has been absolutely brilliant. Like, it's generally sort of like been really fun. There's a video game that I actually encourage you to play because it's very fun, where you play as him and then you have to defeat all the other presidential candidates while learning about his manifesto, um, which is honestly brilliant. Um, and, you know, and I feel like the media is not particularly sympathetic to him because, you know, because he's very, very left-wing. But again, I think he's managed to kind of bypass the media to an extent, and it's worked. So... Um, so I'd say that, yeah, that, that's kind of been this slightly worrying, but also very interesting thing where both extremes have managed to globally so that bypass the mainstream media and run the campaigns like this when, the, you know, the normal, I guess, you know, like candidates from legacy parties, both on the left and the right, are still very much sort of like playing to the rules of, you know, that we've had um, forever. And um, fake news, sorry, like just reading through, fake news has not really been an issue. Um, I think mostly because the French media has been very, very good. So like, you know, like BuzzFeed France has um, basically a few journalists working nearly every day on just sort of, you know, debunking anything that comes out. Uh, I think Libération does it as well, Le Monde does it as well. So like most papers, I think, especially having seen what happened in the US, were like, okay, well, we need something ready. Like every paper is going to need to have their own sort of like cell to deal with fake news. Um, so that's, I'm guessing, quite a good sign so far, but then we'll see. Um, and um, uh, but yes, no. I think that's essentially the point of saying that. I think what well, obviously like, we can't. I can't really have any massive, like, great sweeping conclusions because we have no idea what's going to happen. And you know, I, it may well be President Le Pen in three weeks, and then I look like an idiot. Um, but um, but yes, yeah, so I do think that yeah, essentially, great journalism still does matter and still can have a massive influence on politics. But it's mostly less sort of overwhelmingly reaching the people, but uh, yeah, it's not reaching the people who are feeling quite disaffected by politics anyway. So I think that we are going to need to find out as an industry, and I think that's both for the media and politics, how to reach those people, because clearly like, none of us are managing to, and it's, um, yeah, a worrying thought. Okay, so, so, so just, uh, just a couple of quick, <laughs> quick, quick follow-ups there. So yeah. in terms of mainstream media is still important, but not necessarily reaching young people, which I think is something mm. that, that, that's, that's true everywhere. But what you don't have, uh, from what I was hearing, is you don't have, going back to Tommy's sort of definitions of fake news, you don't have, um, so you don't have very much made-up news, or at least it's being fact-checked, and then there's not necessarily mm. lots of partisan news going on either, or new, new partisan websites in in France, as there have been in the US, for example? Mm. There's not a lot. There's, there are a few bubbles there. We call it La Fachosphere, which is just mm. um, several sort of like small websites which are mostly on the far right. Okay. But they've existed for quite a long time now. And as far as we can tell, they've not, that they are quite influential online, but also have not had an effect on polling um, in terms of like Le Pen, um, as, far, as far as we can tell. OK, thank you very much, Marie, for that uh, perspective, a uh, very different perspective. Let's move on to Peter. I'd like to defend uh, the newspaper industry. Uh, when I began in the newspaper industry more than 40 years ago, I was terrifically left-wing. And it may be wholly coincidental, but I was also a prig and a snob, uh, uh, particularly about newspapers. And I thought that they were uh, raucous, uh, brawling, unscrupulous, and often trivial, and frequently dishonest. It's uh, absolutely true. Uh, they are. Uh, but after 40 years of taking part in this, I think that there is a purpose to it, uh, which we are in danger of losing, and for which there will be no substitute uh, if newspapers are allowed to die. And it's up to you. If you want to let them die, they will die, because in the end, they die when people cease to buy and read them, and this is the danger which we face. It has not happened yet. Uh, I see, for instance, in the United States, uh, the revival of the Washington Post, a hugely encouraging thing after a long period of, of, of decline, which tells us that newspapers can be revived after decline and people can be persuaded to read and buy them again when they cease to do so. Here is the problem, uh, that if they are to be any good, they are to be all the things that so many people dislike. Thomas Jefferson's famous remark that he would rather have newspapers without a government than government without newspapers <laughs> seems to me to be still absolutely right. But he made it because at the time he made it, newspapers were inclined to do a lot of very, very bad things. I think uh, it's quite possible they may even have told lies about American politicians, uh, which made a change from American politicians telling lies about each other. But it was one of the faulty things that they did. I've, look, I've seen all kinds of things. I know now... Uh, that Evelyn Waugh's novel, Scoop, which all of you should have read, and if you haven't, you must read it, is actually a manual 
of how journalism is done in Britain. Everything in it is absolutely true. I've seen everything in it take place. Uh, it's as good a manual to journalism as Graham Greene's Our Man in Havana is to intelligence. And if more people had read Our Man in Havana, we would never have allowed George W. Bush to go to war in Iraq. And the trouble is that not enough people do read these things. Yes, we do misbehave, but there is an enormous corrective power. I never saw anybody who was a real chancer anybody who was prepared to tell an untruth, get away with it. I never saw any newspaper which went down the road of misrepresenting the truth not get caught out by the competition, because we always do compete with each other, and that is our fundamental purpose. We are ultimately commercial organizations. Samuel Johnson said journalism was scribbling on the backs of advertisements. We're not respectable, and nor should we ever be. To be independent of government and of the state, we have to be commercially successful. To be commercially successful, we will sometimes have to do stupid things. There was a famous picture editor on Fleet Street, now deceased, famous for having placed a tortoise in an oven so that it could take part in a picture of spring arriving, posed next to a daffodil, some weeks before spring had actually arrived, but the tortoise wouldn't wake up, so he put it in the oven. I, that kind of thing <laughs> took place. Uh, I, 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 it, it may seem, it may even be a metaphor for some of the practices of Fleet Street. Uh, and, and when you do that in politics, it's even worse. But nonetheless, these, thi these things get found out. And the competition, the rivalry, the brawling, the disagreement, the determination to do down the competition always arrives at the truth in a way that no other system does. The Internet won't do it. No institution on the internet is capable of doing it. It doesn't have the force and power of competition and rivalry which, which Fleet Street has in this country. And it, you will miss us when we've gone if we go. But we're still here. And instead of being contemptuous of us and snobbish and priggish about us, it's time you recognized how valuable we were. Many years ago, and this is a political rather than newspaper remark, a man called Richard Neville who was one of the founders of Oz magazine, that tremendously disreputable, rude 1960s revolutionary magazine, said a very clever thing. He said, in this country, there is an inch of difference between the Labour Party and the Conservative Party. It's only an inch, but it is in that inch that we all live. And in the difference between and the rivalry between free, unfettered, uncontrolled newspapers, an awful lot of liberty is protected and preserved and defended. So please... Keep us alive. Uh, oh, the first applause. No, good. Do go on. Do go on. More <laughs> of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I just want to pick up on, on one thing. You talked specifically about press and newspapers, but of course, when you're talking about the Washington Post having a revival, that is through the internet. It so, is. So, I mean, I assume what the point you're making is more about the institutions and the way they work and the values they have, rather than the actual medium by which they're well, distributed. It, the, it, it, it's been revived thanks to the internet, but nonetheless it is the Washington Post that's been revived. Right. So it's about the institution it, it, and its, it's, it's yes, legacy. Yes, and which is an immensely valuable right. institution. What, what I mean, is it's that? A, it's is a paper I actually loathe right. uh, in many, many ways. But I don't, but, 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 but uh, I, I've, I've no doubt if asked they'd feel the same way about me, but it's, yeah. that's not the problem. But, but that's, what, how it, that's how it ought to be. But it was a newspaper but what, that what was is revived. It? If you, if you it, was good, away, it was a good thing for Washington and a good thing for the United States that it happened. If if you strip away the, the, the print and the form of delivery, what is it about these institutions that you want to preserve? What is it well, I think it is their independence from the, independence independence. From, from the okay. power of the state. Right. Uh, ultimately, if, we, we, we live in, a, in an era which terrifies me, in which people are far too willing uh, to give away their liberties to the state, particularly when they're told, oh, it'll protect you from terrorism. Right. Uh, you know, which, uh, again, it's, 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 it's founding father time. Benjamin Franklin said anybody who, 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 who gives up his liberty in return for security will end up with neither. Uh, we do this all the time, uh, the, particularly when the government says, well, if, if, if only you let us lock you up for longer, if only you, you let us read your emails and listen to your phone calls and list everything you do and s surveil you with cameras, then you will be safe. Okay. Well, what kind well, of person believes well, coming this? Coming slightly stuff? off the subject, though, let, let's, no, it's not. Let, let's, it's, it's, it's the same. So, if you don't have newspapers, there is there, ultimately there is very little force, even in free countries, to, to preserve the liberties okay. that, we, that uh, we have. Moving on to James. Uh, so, uh, yeah, picking up or building or, or, or taking us on a different tangent, as you like. Well, I'm going to slightly disagree with Peter, even though we're we're sort of comrades in arms in, in, on many issues. Don't get uh, carried away. I haven't been <laughs> I haven't been as a journalist as long as he has. I, I, I've been in the trade for about. I mean, it is a trade, by the way, not a, not a profession. Um, 
I've been in the trade for about 30 years, and I've seen it from both sides. I started out at the Daily Telegraph in, in, in the days where newspapers were proper things, and they had really good expense accounts. Uh, and, <laughs> and you live well. You didn't travel first class in those days, but, but they didn't really query your, your, the, these receipts you, you put in. And you could earn a pretty decent living as a journalist. You weren't as well paid as people in the city, but the, the gap wasn't as big as it is now. Um, I wish we still lived in that era. But unfortunately, um, things have changed. One of the things that has changed, uh, uh, of course, is, is that increasingly newspapers are finding it very hard to monetize the, the great product that we journalists churn out. Um, so they can't pay us as much, which inevitably means that the sort of possibly the first rate people it would have attracted once are not so attracted that they're going into our other, other professions. Um, Another problem, of course, is that the internet has come along, which is great in, uh, in many ways because it means you can do your research. I mean, when I was in the Telegraph in the early days, we, we, we had this vast cuttings li library, and you had to go up to the cuttings library, and a, and a, and a chap whose job it was to, to, to go through all the files would, would dig out the cutting. Now you can just look it up on a computer, which makes your job very easy, but at the same time, it means that anyone with a computer can effectively be a journalist. We've got this new blogging culture, so anyone can do what we, we used to get paid lots of money to do because we were special and privileged. Um, I want to have a brief word about um, fake news. Um, I first heard this term. It, it, it's a quite re recent term. I think if you Googled it, you, you wouldn't find many examples of it earlier than, than last year. And the first time I heard of it, I was invited onto the BBC um, on some uh, afternoon Radio 4 discussion program. And I'm always quite wary, being a, an evil right-wing bastard. Um, <laughs> w w when the BBC invites me on, I, I sort of think, are they trying to shaft me? But the guy presenting this program was, was, was Paddy O'Connell. And I thought, I like Paddy O'Connell. I, li I listened to that, that, what the papers review program he does on Sunday mornings, and he sounds a decent cove. I'm, I'm sure he's not going to try and shaft me. And uh, it came just after um, Trump had won the, the election, the presidential election. And um, the, the, the thing they wanted to discuss, that's right, it was the media show. The thing they wanted to dis discuss was why it was that the mainstream media um, had got it so badly wrong. Why had nobody predicted Donald Trump in the same way that the mainstream media pretty much failed to predict Brexit. And I thought, this is my subject, because I've been you know, fighting fight on, on the other side. I'm one of the rebels fighting the evil Death Star of the MSM. I understand the people. I know where they're coming from. I know why Trump won, and I know why Brexit happened. And I'm going to explain it to the BBC. And I'm going to explain that you guys, you were in your ivory towers. You, you weren't in touch with the people. You didn't know what was going on. And I thought, this is going to be great. I'm going to go down really well, tell them lots of interesting things. Anyway, the first question, literally the first question Paddy O'Connell asked me, um, is do you think that Barack, Barack Obama was born in Hawaii? And I thought, he, he's taking the piss. He's, he, he's, 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 he's joking about, what, about his perception of what a kind of Breitbart journalist is like. He can't really mean this. I said, well, well yeah. I mean, I haven't seen his birth certificate. I said, yeah, stringing him along. He said, oh, you haven't seen his birth certificate. So you do believe that he wasn't born in America? I thought, bloody hell. I, I, I came here to talk to tell you interesting stuff about, about, about the media. And here you are trying to catch me out, trying to pin this fake news thing on me. And what I realized is that the BBC and many organizations like the BBC simply could not accept at the time and still cannot accept why Brexit happened and why um, Donald Trump happened. And what they, uh, instead of accepting the truth, that they didn't get it right, they didn't understand at least half the world and the way it thinks, instead they've decided that the reason that Trump happened and the reason that Brexit happened is pretty much the equivalent of Marxist false consciousness. Fake news is this notion invented, I think, by a disappointed mainstream media to explain why the ignorant proles voted against their best interests because they've been brainwashed by these, these stupid Macedonian sites, by these propaganda sites which 
fill their stupid, ignorant peasant heads with foolishness. And that can be the only explanation as to why they didn't vote for the glorious, delightful, uncorrupt, wise Hillary Clinton. Otherwise, she'd have been a shoo-in, wouldn't she? It was only because of this, of this fake news. Well, I'm sorry, um, BBC and, and uh, other MSM people. Fake news is fake news. There's always been fake news. That, uh, you, you can go back to, uh, there's a story in Chaucer about, about the Jews who, who kill the Christian child. They slit its throat, and after, after it's dead, it sings and identifies the people who killed it. So that was a nasty rumor, obviously put about by Christians, I imagine, to discredit Jews. We, we later had a, 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 a similar thing with the, the faked document called the Protocols of the Elders of, of, of Zion. There are other forms of fake news. There's, there's fake news based on, on ignorance. Do you remember the Hitler diaries? Uh, that's, that was fake news. They didn't know it was fake news, but it was. They just hadn't done the research properly. Um, there's a lot of fake news now caused by trolling. OK, I'll wind it up. Um, I love the story about how the, the you know about free bleeding? Some, some pranksters on the 4chan um, uh, website thought, how can, we, how can we make the feminist movement look really embarrassing? I know. Let's invent a really crazy thing that apparently the feminists have thought of. So they invented this phenomenon called free bleeding, where women don't wear um, sanitary towels um, to, in order to display their womanhood in whatever. And they thought, they're never going to fall for this. Well, unfortunately, a few weeks later, this poor girl decided to run a marathon uh, during her period and not wearing... And there were photographs of it. And she thought she was striking a blow for the sisterhood. But she'd been taken in by this, this nasty, horrible, ugly trolling exercise. Uh, we can talk about uh, fake news more and, and the media more. But yeah. Okay. <clears throat> uh, do you want to come, come back on that? Yeah, just, uh, just for the record, I actually don't think Trump won because of fake news. <laughs> I, I, Nor do I. I, I, mean, I think that's a misconception. Frankly, it's, it's, it's almost the, the exactly what you're saying. This is what people who dislike our organizations keep accusing us of, but no one in my organization is saying that. So I think Hillary ran a very bad campaign. I think um, politicians in general didn't recognize some economic and social issues going on in America. I think going back to what I earlier said, the, the issue with the echo chamber is what, what lost the election is because they were only hearing their supporters and they were only talking to their supporters. And I think, frankly, I think the, ma the mainstream media does what you want, misread the data. The truth is, a vote in D.C., in our system, does not have the same weight as a vote in Wisconsin. It just doesn't. But the data said Hillary Clinton was going to win by 3%. She won by 3% of the, the, the popular vote. Just the wrong votes in the wrong places to swing the Electoral College. Uh, so, I, uh, I don't want this to become a discussion right. of why yeah. Trump versus Clinton. Let's, right. uh, yeah. but, let, but, I, but I actually agree with Tommy. Um, I, I find the, the term fake news a very problematic concept. Yeah. And I, uh, we saw this coming a mile away, that one, one person's fake news is another mm. person's you know, Bible of truth and, yeah. and probity. Well, so, we're already seeing on the, on the panel very different uh, And we're already seeing very different in, definitions in, of it. In, so, in, in I mean, chain. if I just can probe a little bit, James, there's a certain consistency. You pointed to some of the greatest lies of all time that have led to massive human suffering and oppression, on the one hand. On the other hand, you sort of seem to be saying that fake news is kind of a catch-all, you know, elite concept used to explain certain political outcomes. And I just am trying to break that down a little bit because there is undoubtedly right now, a level of mendacity and lying and fabrication that is more easily spread and more viral. There's a reason we use that term today than arguably ever before. Now, that does not mean that lying hasn't occurred across all time. I began my points by saying that many yep. of the things we think are new are not, in fact, that new. Yep. The lying is not what's new. I think the ability to spread it, the ability of people who are too credulous and undereducated and underinformed to circulate and recirculate those lies among their networks, I think that's partly new. So you are talking I about also, credulous and informed people, which that, is exactly, it's that snobbery we, we of, may be, of, the, of well, the liberal can, elite media for, before, the, for the ordinary people. They're easily brainwashed. I, d I don't buy into that at all. I didn't, actually, I didn't say the things that you just no, attributed to me. But let, okay, okay, let me, let let me, me please let me finish my point. Please let me finish my point. I think we, when, in looking at the sources of fake news, because this alone could have occupied this entire panel, we have to look at where it's coming from. 
There is state-sponsored propaganda. I'm sure the United States is behind some of it. I, I mean, in terms of formally state-sponsored institutions of news. Yeah. So we can, and, and I think that opens the whole question of what is Russia has been behind, the question of what ha the hackers, that, that's a giant topic of state agency. Just really let me finish to the topic that? analytically. Do you really want to go so there? Let me make an analytical, come after this one let well. me make an analytical point before we get to the normative. There's st state sources of so-called fake news. And then there's commercial sources. When, when Tommy was talking about the Macedonian Sony, warehouse, yeah. who knows how prevalent it was, but there's no doubt that people are making a profit off of peddling lies. The scope of that, the extent of it, the impact of it, that we can all debate. The fact of it cannot be debated. Okay, so I think we're, we're definitely uh, uh, getting down a fake news rabbit hole, but there, there, are, there are these different definitions and actually of, of what the problem is, and then... Once you've defined those, then you can start to have conversations about how you solve the different, very different uh, things that are in that bucket of fake news. Uh, I want to bring in Marie because you. you uh, uh, no, I just had a quick um, factual point to make, which is like I don't, because I do think that it's you know it is a slight exaggeration to say that you know mainstream journalists are just running around saying you know well the peasants have got it wrong. Um, but mostly the thing is you know like there was a study and the Some single of us came most from peasants. sorry <laughs> so, quite a number of us came from peasants. And our, and, well, and, yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, but I think like, there is the fact that you know the single most read story during the entire Brexit campaign um, was the Express story saying if Remain wins, uh, the NHS will stop. You know, that'll be the end of the NHS. And surely, I mean, we can. And I'm not saying that I don't think fake news won. You know, like won it for Brexit. I honestly don't. But I think surely that we can all agree on this panel that there is an issue of the single most read story in the entire campaign. And what was you know so like a massive campaign and a messy campaign was something that was you know. Either factually correct, at least you know, slightly. Okay, how, many, how many of you have tried to fool a peasant? It's actually quite hard. The, the people who it's easy to fool are intellectuals. They're incredibly easy to fool. Can I just come, uh, come, come back to a substantive point, which was um, which was raised in, in the campaign, which is which is which is something around the um, the role of the journalist being out of touch with. Uh, with the rest of society you know, and um, being up on its pedestal and um, you know a lot of the trust figures that are talked about is quite often about um, the the politicians uh, and the journalists now being too close together so journalists instead of being actually representing people being out in the midwest or uh, in the northeast of england uh, they're actually in london and they're not really in touch in the way that i think you described at the beginning uh, Pete. Do, do we think there's some truth in that 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 journalists actually are now too close to Politicians that George Osborne, for example, can be both editor of the Evening Standard and a member of Parliament. Is this part of the problem? There's a definite sociological oh. truth, if I can yeah. attempt an answer at that. I'd lightly like your observation about journalism being a, a, cra a trade or a craft as opposed to a profession, a point I tried to make less eloquently earlier. Um, sociologically, having journalists come from a class that seem to go to the same schools and have it the same um, social milieus, mm -hmm. hang out in a very clubby way at the same kinds of dinners and cocktail parties, that is part of the problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, to the extent that, you know, a few generations ago, I mean, a few generations ago, journalism was probably less diverse in terms of race and gender, but probably a, a good deal more socioeconomically diverse. Mm -hmm. In terms of many people who did not have university degrees could tell stories. Absolutely. Storytelling and narrative are, in fact, the heart of what we do. That's not something for which you require, that requires a PhD. So I think that's a real sociological problem. And, I mean, Marie, in, in one sense, this is why organizations like BuzzFeed have been successful, because the mainstream media weren't reaching out to young people, for example. So, mm -hmm. And the Internet's made that possible. You know, and it's kind of like having, I only ever worked in newspapers before joining BuzzFeed. And, um, and you know, and it's been really interesting the fact that now, um, you know, in news meetings in the morning, um, it's like we're overwhelmingly female reporters. Um, and, you know, and it's not, I mean, you know, with apologies, apologies to the white men on the panel, yeah. but, you know, I feel like news yeah. meetings in, at the Telegraph and at the Standard were kind of, you know, yeah. this sea this of white men. This must feel very different, so, right, yeah, to, no, no, to your BuzzFeed. Yeah, it yeah, no, brings me back, um, <laughs> Telegraph days. <so. laughs> Um, but yeah, but it, it is really nice, and I do think that as a result, the way we, you know, the, the way we tell stories and also the kind of stories we cover is going to be different because, you know, like we're going to have people from all backgrounds, of all races, and obviously genders. And yeah, and, and I, I do think it makes journalism better. Peter, uh, do you think this is part of part of the problem of journalism as we got sort of too cosy with the politicians, or um, hugely too, uh, too close? And, and this began really seriously uh, during the end of the uh, conservative rule, uh, the, the major era, really, when the Labour Party pretty much set out on an operation to, to get control of political journalism. 
And once they were in government, uh, particularly uh, because the government was more or less run as a press operation, uh, that intensified, and all governments since then have done so. And I sometimes despair uh, at, the, at the way in which the most of, there are noble exceptions, most of the, the political reporters in this country have simply become mouthpieces of the government of the day. And it's, it's very distressing to listen to it. Fortunately, there are other people outside this yep. circle who can still point it out, but far too close and much closer than they were when I was in the parliamentary lobby back in the middle 80s. Uh, there was a lot more uh, diversity of a different kind, let's say diversity of opinion, diversity of approach, uh, than there is now. And, and, and we're seeing something slightly different missing. but related now, which is that, um, for example, um, Donald Trump is taking particular news organizations and giving them scoops like which, Breitbart. Well, this is what you well, do. I mean, it's, 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 it's done in return for, it's done in return for favors. Right. Uh, you, the, the, it's, it's a straightforward system exchange, of right? reward. For favorable coverage, that you, you, you get the scoop, you get the interview, and therefore you give more favorable coverage. I think, uh, well, um, I think it's more a question of, um, it's a bit like the BBC is currently complaining a lot that, it, that it, it's being denied its, its, its press passes um, by the White House, uh, which I think is a fantastic piece of trolling from the, from the, the king troll, President Trump. Um, and they've given a press, not a press pass to the BBC, but one to Lucian Wintridge, who writes for Gateway Pundit, a mm -hmm. young, handsome, gay journalist, kind of like a junior Milo. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I kind of think, yeah, um, <laughs> it's sad that the BBC haven't got their press pass, but the way that they treated Trump throughout the presidential campaign, the way that they rooted for Hillary all the way, um, but the point I was making was that if, 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 you're, if you're getting access, then isn't your independence in some way? Uh, um, I, I, look, I, I have no um, editorial uh, power at, mm. at Breitbart. I would like to think that um, they, they, would, they would hold the president to account in areas where he diverged ideologically from Breitbart, Breitbart's Philosophy. Is there I mean, an example I certain, in which I Breitbart certainly has held Trump to account? I don't know. Okay. Um, I don't, I, <laughs> that's I, I, that's I don't, probably the job of the rest of the press to hold um, Breitbart well, to account, well, right? Well, yeah, no, totally. <laughs> I, it, it, I mean, the stories I've written, for example, mm -hmm. um, I'm very disappointed so far by um, one of his picks, um, the guy who's in charge of the EPA, Scott Pruitt. Um, I certainly didn't get any pushback when I when I wrote three stories saying Scott Pruitt is not is not doing his job. Okay, um, I, I, I want to take some questions from the audience, so just have have a think about it. But um, uh, before I do, on, on this question of access, because um, CNN was also has, has been affected by this, um, Tommy, what what what's your sort of sense about whether uh, the press was too close and this 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 sort of very very different approach that's being taken by the White House? Um, I, I do think that the, the press in the States was too close. I think the, the, the classic criticism of, the, of all of the DC press corps has been it's very sort of myopic inside the beltway. Um, and I think that affected our election coverage greatly to earlier points. Um, I, he, but it's interesting. I mean, the, he, and he, we even blocked from certain things and, and it's been made a little bit more, diff, our life been made a bit more difficult for, for access on, on trips and in, into press briefings and then you know that it's a bit of a game that the, the, the Trump White House is playing that's fine but if you look at yesterday Sean Spicer who desperately wanted to clarify some really unfortunate remarks uh, came to us because he knew that he, I, I believe uh, that he thought if it went to um, one of the, their traditional favored uh, media sources, it, it, the, the apology or the clarification right. wouldn't have been taken as seriously. He wouldn't be able to reach certain types of people. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, do you think it's in a way a, a good thing, Sewell, that, that um, the press is now seen as more distant and, and, and you know, having, having uh, disagreements with, I, I with think politicians? The detachment's a good thing. I think the assumption of, that the press has a skeptical or at least arm's length mm. relationship from power is really important. I think we don't necessarily need to be adversarial in every instance, but our natural position should be adversary rather than cozy, yeah. adversarialness rather than coziness. 
Um, I, we, can I make one other point about access? I think there's, when we talk about access, we're talking about two kinds of things. I mean, the physical access to the White House press room, well, that's, we can talk about that. In a way, a little bit too much attention goes into that. I think the larger access question is getting too close to your sources, trusting them based, it, trusting their kind of unverified claims, emphasizing the demands of the scoop, and we all are journalists, we know what it's, how, how important the scoop is, but then privileging the scoop, i.e. getting being first, privileging that over being right, and doing the acts of verification and second guessing and double checking and skepticism of one's sources. So I think we're, when we're talking about access, we're talking about two different things, and I think people, the second kind of access, I think, is the more troubling kind, mm -hmm. where you're exchanging your credulousness for access to, you know, confidential information. Yeah. Okay. Let, let me take some questions. So, if you've got, if you're interested, put up your hand, and I would just remind you that when you get called, wait for the microphone and um, do give your name and affiliation uh, or organization. Okay. So, I'm going to take uh, one in the middle there. Yes, please, the lady in the middle. Um, my name is Magda Walter. I'm a former journalist and an independent media consultant now. And if I could ask a question that is also a bit of a challenge for the panel, if I, if I may. Um, the subject on which I've been working for the last two and a half years has barely been mentioned. Why only one of you, 45 minutes into the conversations, used the word Russia and the role of Russia in poisoning the whole ecosystem of news. Okay, so you're specifically asking about, about the role about they're playing. I'm asking about your opinions about Russia, but I also would ask if you could possibly broaden the conversation a little beyond the Anglo-Saxon context, because besides the, the brief inter intervention about France, hmm. we are not really talking about more than just British politics. Okay. Uh, okay, I don't know. Magnus' if any... question is crucial. Can I quickly yeah. address it? And then hopefully yeah. someone else will pick it up as having mentioned Russia. I'm definitely not a Russia expert, not pretending to be, but having just traveled personally in recent months to Poland and Bulgaria, I think one of the things that's very interesting in Eastern Europe right now is this debate over the true freedom of the press. A lot of the institutions that we represent, including the new ones like BuzzFeed, they're kind of the access to capital and kind of access to newsmakers is kind of taken for granted. I think all of us here have that to some extent, including Breitbart. I think in, in many, many other countries where freedom of press traditions, press law and media freedom are still much more unsettled, you're coming out of a Cold War tradition, and there's this concern in countries like Poland and Hungary with having on, on the face of it liberal democracy, but in reality the actual drawing in of the, of the ability to have truly independent and critical voices. That's pivotal. I think that's the most pivotal thing that's been mentioned in this discussion so far. Mm. Anybody else want to comment on that? Well, I'm not a Russian expert. I, I lived in the Soviet Union for a year and a half and then found myself living in Russia instead. And as a result, I have this unique ability, almost completely unshared by anybody in the media post. I can tell Russia from the Soviet Union. They're not the same place. Uh, and I think that the, the, the recreation of the, the, the Kremlin bogey has been one of the stupidest and most ridiculous developments of the past several years. Uh, let me first of all point out that Russia has a GDP smaller than that of Italy uh, and is not actually a major power in any form or shape. Uh, secondly, yes, of course, Vladimir Putin is a sinister tyrant, but he is not an ideological tyrant, and he has no interest in subverting the rest of the world in building or in building a global navy or any of the other things that the Soviet Union did. And I, I, I tire of the attempts to turn Russia into, into a bogey and indeed to foment uh, ridiculous conflicts and pretenses of border threats uh, and menaces from Russia, a country which has withdrawn from, I think, 400,000 square miles uh, of Europe uh, without a fight in the past 30 years. We really do need to get this into proportion. I also think a huge number of Clinton supporters in the United States have decided that Vladimir Putin is responsible for their candidate's failure to win the election. It's very handy for them to think it, but actually the person responsible for Hillary losing the election was Hillary, not Vladimir Putin, who couldn't, I don't think, have arranged her defeat if he'd wanted to. Okay, uh, let me take some more questions. So I think there was a hand down here. Take that one, and then I'll go to the back over, back left after that. Hi, um, I'm James Glancy. I'm, I'm not in the media. I'm, for, I'm a military man, but I did have a little dabble recently in the Times with, a, with an article. Um, 
A question really uh, is about the mainstream media and to what extent um, the mainstream media has undermined freedom of, freedom of speech by uh, essentially um, peddling a very politically correct and narrow um, uh, freedom of speech um, on a wide range of topics, whether that's immigration, uh, right. whether that's issues in society. And actually that's led to a backlash. And I'm not saying now that there isn't more freedom of speech with the likes of Breitbart, with the likes of the Huffington Post, but the mainstream media um, actually um, having effect on, on freedom of speech and undermining some of the pillars we're talking about, specifically democracy. Okay, so this, this is around, has the media constrained debate? There's a big, big discussion around that in Germany, actually, as well, um, which is much more sort of centre. There's much, there's much fewer sort of um, uh, uh, more partisan me media in places like Germany. So, James, you want to pick that up first? Um, yeah. Um, Peter made a very spirited case for the, for the print media, and I think there are some honorable examples. Uh, but I do feel that, apart from the monetization thing I mentioned, and apart from uh, these everyone can be a journalist thing, I think the third reason why the mainstream media is dying is because it failed to do its job. There were certain stories it didn't cover properly. Um, Such and as? Such as? So, well, the most obvious one for me is, is the whole um, climate change thing. Um, it was extraordinary. Ten years ago, well, uh, uh, particularly um, 2009 was when, the, was, was when the climate gate scandal right. broke. It was virtually uncovered in any of the oh, print on. newspapers. <laughs> My own newspaper, which is, which is the, second yeah, biggest, well, kind of the second biggest Sunday circulation in the country, has had, had huge amounts of coverage of the things that you mentioned, much of it written by David Rose, which you must recognize. The fact that it wasn't in The Guardian, I mean, would you expect it to be? But that's <laughs> yeah. the whole point of having a diverse press. Yeah, so we I think, we so had a different point of view, I and it was, it was available there. Dave, David Rose actually came quite, quite late to the story. And I, 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 well, I, tell him you said I, so. I, I, well, he's <laughs> We, we, we talk all the time. Okay, but, but I, I understand the point. I, I want to hear. So, on, on the um, what, what about in, in in France? Do you have a similar discussion around? Uh, is the media trying to, to not talk about certain things, uh, particularly around, you know, some of the the issues that Marine Le Pen wants to wants to, to raise? It does does that part of the of the electorate not get represented by mainstream media? Um, to an extent, I'd say actually, to um, for a start, I don't think it really is a freedom of speech issue. Like, it is an issue I think which is worth talking about, but also. People not being commissioned is not, you know, them being denied their rights in any way. I think, um, but um, but no, actually, I think if anything, the UK press has been a lot more enthusiastic about Marine Le Pen than the French French press has right. been. Um, but I'm not, uh, I'm not exactly sure. No, I do think that obviously, yes, most newspapers in France will kind of like hover around the cent mm -hmm. like the centre of politics. We've got. Liberes from Le Monde, which are essentially, if you take the Guardian, split it in two. So if you take the sort of like more highbrow sort of like you know, self-important thing, that's Le Monde. And if you take the more sort of like youth kind of stuff, that's Liberation. Yeah. And then we've got Le Figaro, which is essentially the Telegraph. Yeah. And that's sort of like, these, these are our three main papers. So I think it's a fairly similar situation where, you know, we hover around the centre. And I'm but, kind of interested in your perspective because you're both, you know, looking at it. I, at, you're, you're living in London, so you're looking at the, sure. at the British press and you've got a view of where that's partisan and where there's a diverse opinion. But you also, you know, look at the US media. How, how are they different? Um, uh, well... Huge differences, actually. I mean, the the American press. I think uh, there is this attempt to um, to be neutral, or at least a, which is to varying degrees of, of success. But you know, Fox News's slogan is fair and balanced, and that's what they want to project, and that's great. Um, in the UK, <laughs> I can see what you think of that. <laughs> so, so you basically and, have partisan television yeah. and, 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 and more and then, neutral press. Uh, yeah, in the states, it's, it's very partisan. And in, in Britain, you know, I think as an American, I was my first reaction to British papers was I, I was actually quite surprised at how they, they wore their party affiliation on their sleeve. But also yeah. the, the range of opinion, right? But so, range of so, opinion. So not, and and not going back to, to the gentleman's question, I think this is why we're living in such an amazing time for journalism. Is that there, there are so many voices out there, mainstream and otherwise, and I still think that the definition of mainstream needs to be completely readjusted because everybody has, everybody has access to the same information, the same audience. So everybody, there is so, I, I welcome all the voices. I welcome people disagreeing with my coverage and, and saying CNN isn't covering this. The truth is, if CNN wanted to just be a profitable website or you know, we could do, run cat videos all day, but we don't do that. You know, we, we try to pick... Um, try to choose the stories that, that are important to our viewers, 
do we always get it right? Absolutely not. But you know, we, we are working with the resources we have and the restrictions we have and the time we have. I think, and everyone is pretty much newspaper um, based, except for or, or web based. I mean, I'm, I'm, my background is I'm, I'm obviously I'm a television background. I'm actually a photographer background. Um, I spent a lot of my career in, in Iraq and Afghanistan because I felt very passionate at that point in my life, um, and also from a military <coughs> family, I was very passionate at that point in life that the 18 year old kid in the, the foxhole story wasn't being told. And it wasn't, at that point, we didn't have such a diverse opinions. And I thought it was very important to be in an organization like CNN because I could get there. I could get to al -Ambar, and I could tell some Marine story. And, I, and those stories had more of an impact to viewers back home about, about the Iraq war than interviewing generals or sitting in DC. And Nonetheless, yeah. people who watch the big TV channels must have noticed their belief in this thing called the center uh, and the idea that there is a set of acceptable opinions uh, which are by and large those which are reflected. And they're reflected on huge numbers of things, whether it be foreign intervention, whether it be man-made climate change, uh, whether it be sexual politics. Very, very quickly, they move towards conformity. Uh, they're not anything like as competitive uh, with each other, I, I, except Fox News. I, but I, as, a cons yeah. as, a cons yes, I, as a conservative, I don't think <coughs> Fox News is any friend of my cause. Uh, I don't regard it as conservative, I regard it as neoconservative, which is a, a wholly different thing. But th that's about the only example of, of diversity of opinion in large-scale broadcasting okay. that there I, is. I, Otherwise, it's you, very, very conformist. Just one quick thing. Okay. I think you're, and then you're sort of a few years behind now. I think the world has moved on. I think we are living in an environment with so many opinions. Where we, organizations like Breitbart are in White House press briefings, where, where you can get a, a diversity of opinion. And, okay, so and you think the consensus is, 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 is changing? It's changing, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah I've, so, worked, I've worked on both the opinion news sides of the New York Times. I don't, yeah. there's, there's no shortage of opinion. There's a shortage of interesting opinion, there's a shortage of meaningful opinion, and there's a shortage of opinion <laughs> that people who dis might disagree with you actually are willing to listen to. But, I mean, when you look at the activity, and part of the problem of our time is that we associate, I think, a lot of the media with commentary. And look, we all have opinions, we all like sharing them, it's really fun. But a big part of what our effort and expenditure goes towards, speaking for my organization, is actually bearing witness the old-fashioned way. The New York Times won three Pulitzer Prizes this week, one for a series about Russian kind of cyber and dark arts operations in the kind of cyber landscape, one for um, a, a chronicle, a very moving chronicle of a Marine's who served in Afghanistan, came back into the U.S., and ultimately his life totally went downhill. He didn't get a lot of support. His life kind of turned to, to despair. And the third was chronicling the drug war in the Philippines involving President Duterte. None of these involve, no disrespect to cat videos, but none of these involved things that were particularly popular or fun, and none of them, I might add, was particularly partisan. You can come with any kind of political right. point of view and come to these stories and derive your own conclusions about policy or about ideology. That's the bread and butter of what we do. So this is actually back to you know, the fourth state idea of holding, holding people to a rich and powerful yep. to account. Um, but actually just to, to talk about cat videos and, and BuzzFeed, um, I, I, we, should be, we should be really clear that BuzzFeed have done some of the best yeah. investigative journalism over the last year in the UK. Uh, using data and, and some of the, the, these new methods, right? But it costs money. I mean, going back to the economic model, the only reason you can do that is because you found some kind of answers to some of these uh, economic problems. I uh, know exactly. And if, if, hang on. Um, yeah, no. Um, no? Yeah, we can hear you. So, no, all good. Okay, cool. It's all good. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, no, I think, you know, that's, um, I think that part of the reason why it's so nice to be working at BuzzFeed is that, you know, as journalists, especially like, I'm on the news side, you know, we get given the space and the time to write what we want. If we've got, you know, like a good leader or a good something, you know, like we will have an editor who will go, like, you know, honestly, you take as much time as you want, which I never personally had anywhere else I'd work because normally, you know, probably because it was newspapers and, you know, paper cycle, but also because it was like, well, you know, you just have to get stories out, we just have to get traffic. But I think the way BuzzFeed has done it is realizing that effectively, you know, um, news doesn't really do massive traffic most of the time. It does occasionally, but, you know, we can't base a business model on saying we can do news and going to do news, but that's where we're going to get our views as well. Um, and yes, I think having that entire other part of the website, well, yes, you know, we do cat videos and lists and stuff. And, you know, and we're essentially sort of like two separate offices happen to be in the same building. Um, that, you know, we'll be that person you're friends. But, yeah, so... Of news think, and entertainment. So, yeah. yeah so, but, and but that, kind of, that yeah. does raise the question, though, uh, if, if news doesn't sell, what does happen to the Baghdad Bureau, that sort of classic question? Uh, mm. and, and, and that is, I guess, going back to our earlier conversation about size, Peter, you know, it's, it's not just about independence. You also need those organisations to have 
the weight, the mass to, to sort of survive in, in this uh, very fragmented world. Of course you do. Um, and, and, if, and, if, and if the newspaper equivalent of cat videos is necessary <laughs> to make the money to do it, then that's what right. you have to do. And let's not yep. be snobbish about it. Yep. Uh, a lot of people who pretend to be snobbish about it will actually, A, watch cat videos, and B, <laughs> read, the, re, read, read the bits of the paper which aren't entirely serious before they read the bits which are, because that's what we're all like. But yep. you know, we, we like to pretend that we're tremendously uh, intellectual and uh, gullible. But it, uh, the truth is that we're a, deep down, we're all peasants. Uh, okay, so we had a question at the back uh, on, on the left, and then I'll go there in the middle. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Lauren McEvitt, and sorry, Peter, I'm a former government spinner. Um, but uh, my question I'm was glad about... glad it's former. Uh, my, uh, my question was about the decline in the uh, volume rather than the quality of foreign correspondence. Um, one of the things I noticed working in sub-Saharan Africa over the last couple of years is that the continent goes largely uncommented upon beyond the one correspondent who's based in Nairobi covering off the entire continent. Um, do you feel that enough investment is being put into the volume of people covering parts of the globe that are important to voters here, particularly now that they have to spend 0.7% of their budget on foreign aid? Uh, let's, let's start with uh, uh, yeah, CNN. Hopefully my, my bosses are watching, I'd say, no, we don't have enough investment. Um, I'm responsible for 15 bureaus in Europe, Africa, Middle East, including uh, three in sub-Saharan Africa. I wish I had another three. Uh, I think there's amazing stories in Africa that, that do go undercover, uh, undercovered. Um, but there's a sort of the reality of, of, of what of our budgets and what we can do. And, and uh, I actually think uh, we've... I can only speak for CNN. I'm quite proud of our Africa coverage. Our, our coverage of the Chibuk girls, I think, was, was really strong. Um, we do a lot of business, a lot of business stories out of Africa. It's a, it's a big, it's, it's a commercially, it's a big market for us. It's very, it's a very important place for us. We feel very passionate about it. We have four, CNN International has four story, uh, four programs a week dedicated to Africa. Um, but yeah, we could do so much more. And uh, but I, could, I could have more. I suppose part of it is how, how the, the um, news industry is organized, though. I mean, we yeah. don't need every paper to have a foreign correspondent. The fact that we don't anymore doesn't necessarily mean that people are worse off, does it? Uh, oh, I, I do think people are worse off. I think yeah. we need as many eyes and ears we, on the we ground have more, as uh, possible. We have more uh, possibilities to get international news than ever before through the internet. Yes, though. but in sure, places sure. that Lawrence talked about, some of the developing countries, places that, we're, where, that are information poor, right? We are. Right. It, this, the the internet's view of the world is not the world. It's a very, very focused on information-rich environments. Right. I mean, we have but that requires market intervention, doesn't it, um, Peter? Uh, to, well, to, can to, I, to if I can just make a point, we, we 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 have full-time people in Cairo, Tunis, Dakar, right. Johannesburg, and Nairobi. And no, it's not enough. So go to nytimes.com and join our three million subscribers. <laughs> it's not enough. <laughs> Plug over. Um, <laughs> thanks. It, it's. It's silly to imagine that it could be done anymore. When I, I joined the then Daily Express in 1977, uh, which was still uh, owned by a company called Beaverbrook Newspapers, it had a daily sale of two and a quarter million. It had full-time correspondence in Bonn, Paris, and Rome, uh, two in New York, another one in Washington, a huge number of stringers. There were people who I shared the office with who'd spent half their lives reporting from such places as Katanga, if any of you remember what that was, uh, it, a huge amount of its, uh, of, of its existence had been taken up in, in, in the reporting of the, of the drama of the, of the 1950s, particularly in, in, in Africa. Nobody could do that now uh, because there isn't the money and because also the pound sterling doesn't carry as far as it does. Foreign reporting is incredibly expensive. Not because foreign reporters spend all their money on lunch, but because the, the setting up of a, of a bureau, the, 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 the communications, the, the necessary translators and fixers that you need to employ if you're going to do it properly, are all very expensive indeed. And, and, and unless and until people start buying newspapers on the scale that they used to, they can't expect them to be able to do that sort of thing and, anymore. And yet, I wish they could. Everybody wishes they could. And, and yet, I really yet, do. And but it's Buzz, very Buzz difficult. And has opened uh, an office in, in um, Nigeria, right? In, uh, uh, I think. I think so. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's just a stringer. I, might I, I, I think we've got, we definitely have someone there okay. who does freelance stuff it for us quite regularly. Okay. I don't know if it's I'm officially on hot ground. Let, let, let me, uh, take, um, I, I said there was going to be one there and then one there next. Hi. 
Uh, hi. Uh, hi, my name is Maria Bocharova. I used to be involved in the media, but no longer. I'm now in publishing. Um, my question is this. Um, so is it to, to return, I suppose, to a slightly earlier point? Um, I'd like to make two brief comments. Um, on truth, is it the case that um, we have increased uh, the, the extent to which mis untruths are told in the media, or is it just that our verification of those facts have improved over time. Um, and secondly, in a world where we are, um, I, think, I think we can hopefully agree that the world is more educated than it ever was before, um, how can we um, suggest that we are, that the world is not making an, in, in quotes, informed decision about um, voting or about uh, their opinions? Okay, so what? So one, one or... oh, can I just say on truth? Yeah. I, I don't think people are telling deliberate lies. I think people believe things to be true. And right, and one particular thing which is, uh, which is particularly bothering me at the moment, for the past several days I've heard very many journalists and very many politicians maintain, for instance, that it is a proven fact that the Syrian government used chemical weapons in Ghouta in August 2013. If you actually go to the United Nations Security Council reports on this episode, they do not say that. Uh, but because it has become believed, uh, everybody keeps on writing it and nobody checks it. That's my job, doing the sort of thing I do, to call attention to this. And I think other people will eventually pick it up and sooner or later it will, it will be corrected. This is the point of having a competitive press with many voices in it. Those, but the people who did this didn't set out to tell something which they knew to be untrue. They just believed it was true, took refuge, as people so often do, in numbers, and carried on saying it. Uh, and many of the, 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 much of the disaster, as I view it, of what's happened over Syria in the past few days is a result of that sort of thing. But to, to, to suggest that it's a result of people deliberately telling the truth is completely wrong. None of those people, I believe, have, have wicked or dishonest motives. They were just carried away, and it's in the, in, in the nature of the business. But there are correctives, just as there were correctives about Iraq. Yeah. And if there's no competition and no diversity of opinion, there aren't any correctives. That's the, that's the important point. Sure. Marie, I think you've raised a really profound observation at a time when so many people have had access to education and opportunities, why, is, why do we live in a world that's so hospitable to lying and, uh, and mistruth? And to more specifically address the fact-checking question, I think this issue of information overload and of kind of our cognitive bandwidth for processing mistruth, truth, and fact-checking needs to be examined much more thoroughly. Many organizations have full-time, as Marie pointed out, either you know, truth squads or fact-checking units or units focused on calling out the lies and verifying what's really true. I, some recent studies have been very, very interesting. That when you present people with, well, you believe this and this is actually wrong, that their minds actually kind of shut down. Instead of opening, they actually become more hardened in their positions. And I read an essay recently, um, I'm forgetting who wrote it, but it was about this idea that perhaps instead of our approach to fact-checking originating from statements by leaders, like we, we, we listen to statements from people in power, then we check whether it's true or not. But instead of that, that's actually not the right framework. That's not how we mentally process facts. That's not how we approach curiosity, and that maybe we should take an approach that's based on issues yeah. and start with on an issue like, say, climate change. Look at the universe of what people believe and then issue by issue go through that set of beliefs and try to arrive at what the facts are. This is very interesting. And <clears throat> open the curiosity gap instead of simply saying X leader said this and that's not true. This is um, very like, uh, so full fact in the UK basically taking that approach. So instead of doing the literal fact checking, they're, they're basically looking at what's the question yeah. and then trying to find the answers and find the experts to sort of cast, cast light. Uh, so, I mean, I, I, that's a really interesting sort of point is, do we think that there's so much opinion out there, there's a sort of information overload, that we're really all struggling to find the signal in the noise, and actually understanding is going down, almost because we've got too much information, or is, is that completely missing the point, Marie? Um, as a quick point to that, I think also part of the problem is the fact that data has been wildly overused over the past few years, um, and, it's, you know, and I think that that's been covered by um, a few pieces, which I really can't remember, but, you know, is the fact that, you know, anyone can have access to data now. And essentially, you know, like not necessarily make it say whatever they want, but you know, can very much sort of like interpret it in a way that it didn't use to happen. Data has become a lot more political. And, um, you know, even polling and such. And so I think that 
it is kind of worrying because, you know, it used to be the sort of, you know, well, on one hand, you know, you've got the opinion and on the other, you've got the fact and what's more factual than numbers. Hmm. Uh, but you if, can use that data in any way. So, yeah, and so if the public yeah. are losing faith in the numbers as well, hmm. in terms of, like, you know, beyond the facts, I think it's, yeah, even James, more worrying. James, do, do, do you have a view on this? Yeah, I, I love the idea that if only we had more fact-checkers, we'd reach the ultimate truth. <laughs> um, the problem... Breitbart's not keen the, on the, fact-checkers. The, 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 the very idea... <laughs> Nice cheap nice, shot. It was nice very cheap, cheap by now. I'm sorry. Yeah. Keep, keep going, keep going. <laughs> Don't fall on the far right. Um, I think it's a false notion that there, is out, there, there are out there these, these um, objective seekers after truth journalists uh, who, who work for organisations like the BBC and the New York Times, but, but not at Breitbart. It's an absolute nonsense. It's, it's, it, it is and always has been a myth that... Um, that journalists' ideology doesn't creep into their reporting. Of course, we all strive to tell the, the truth, as, as, as Peter says, but inevitably our view of what is and isn't true is coloured by our, 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 our political bias. And um, truth might not, might not be a literal truth, it might be a higher, a high, a higher truth. I think there is, there is such a thing as an objective truth, I do believe that, right, but it's okay. very, very hard for us all to reach it, and I think that we ought to get away from this idea that... There are certain organisations which, which, which do that. I mean, the B I know I keep coming back to the BBC because I particularly hate it, but the BBC is obliged by its, its, its charter to be neutral and, 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 and balanced, and it mm. fails in that. Breitbart, for example, never pretends well, that it's anything it other, than, view, other right? than a right-wing news, news site. I think the New York Times ought to be all more, and CNN ought to be more honest about their ideological biases. They're not kind of neutral observers. Oh, OK, I'm going to bring CNN back in, a little bridling there. Yep. <laughs> it, it, it's, you know, being an American and working for CNN, I, I always find this really puzzling when the right accuses us of being the left and the left accuses us of being the right. Well, um, you are. A am I? Uh, I mean, from, is he both? No, am I both? CNN, CNN is, uh, is definitely, I would say, to the left of Breitbart. It's really interesting. I, I, mean, I, 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 I think everything is to the left of Breitbart. I find, it, I I mean, find it's like, fascinating that you, that you even, even argue that point. I, I'm not arguing that we're and not to the left of Breitbart. Okay, okay, I mean, like, trust me, we finally have complete you, agreements on the panel. I'm the left of the centre, I would, I would say, as well. Well, I think there's a lot of people on the left who would disagree with that. CNN is to the left of Breitbart insofar as you have a fact-based, verification-based organisation versus a far-right media. Outlet. In that sense, it's true. It's yes. a very narrow definition. Okay, right. next question. Uh, okay, I'll take, uh, I'll take one from this side because I haven't... Yes, uh, at the back there. Uh, hello, I'm Rajiv Sharma, member of Chatham House. Now, you know, I think mainstream media is at a tipping point of credibility because what has happened in Brexit and Trump and other coverage is that ordinary people don't believe you anymore, right? I mean... What I, my question to you, as far as CNN is concerned, is, you know, how long is it going to take you to rebuild the trust of the American people? And my question, the other question I have is, was the BBC invited here? And if, if they were, why aren't they here? Because the trust in the BBC has been shattered. Okay, so let's, um, let's, let's leave the BBC one out, out yeah. for the moment and stick with CNN as, 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 as they're on the panel. I think what we can do is we can uh, hold people in power accountable. We can do as honest of a job as we can. We can try to um, bring in other voices that onto our network. And I think we've, we've been very opening to bring in people, dissenting voices and Trump supporters and, and people getting a, a breadth of, of opinions on our air. But I think more importantly, that we just have to do our jobs. And the, there's no magic wand. We can't just sort of snap our fingers. But we can't just sort of say, you know. And, and, and I would actually, part of, your, part of your, your question I would disagree with. I think there are people in the United States who will, do not believe a word we say. I think there are people who do believe us. Uh, I've interestingly been going through a whole load of uh, comments about uh, people's views of bias of the BBC in the last uh, little while. And... There are a lot of people who think the BBC is biased, particularly over the Brexit thing, actually. And, and the thought I had was that when you get really polarising issues, uh, Israel-Palestine being a classic, or, uh, or Brexit, that actually the, the organisation that's trying to be balanced and fair in the middle really has a, has a hard time and is attacked from left and right. And so trust goes down because those issues are felt so deeply by that group of people. I don't know if, if people... I think thought there so. was a study of the BBC's Brexit coverage that yeah. found, I, I'm not an expert on this, but what, what I recall reading was this 
that because they took the charter seriously of fair and neutral coverage, yeah. that they gave, in a sense, equal time to both sides and yeah. didn't accurately or have enough time. False equivalence. False equivalence. That's a question of false equivalence. It's in particular, to 350 million pounds a week for the mm. NHS. Mm. That, from what I understand, that misinformation was kind of allowed to permeate the atmosphere without being questioned sufficiently. Yeah, I just think polarization makes it really hard. If, uh, uh, okay, let's take uh, a couple, oh, there's loads of hands here. Uh, one at the back and then one in the middle to the front. Let's just take two together and then we can, yeah, so it's this one here. Hi, I'm uh, George Baldwin and I'm a politics student at the University of Exeter. Um, I am a millennial that uh, Peter's paper often likes to, you know, have a little dig at occasionally. Oh. Um, and Trish. there's a, the way that younger people access uh, the media and the news, you know, Snapchat now has news outlets such as the Daily Mail, BuzzFeed in particular. Um, do you feel that the sort of shrinking down of news into 140 characters or into a, into a snap, can, can it truly sort of put across an objective view or is is it becoming more subjective due to sort of tweets and and the media being having to sort of contain itself down into something that's available to people with perhaps shorter attention spans okay so are, are we dumbing down through you know these new formats and uh, do they have a role maybe go to buzzfeed first I, and then. I don't actually have an answer to that but what i'll say is that so we've got i mean we've got lots of very clever gadgets um on the cms or the buzzfeed website and one of them is that we can see, so like people click, we can see the amount of people who clicked, and then per paragraph, we can see how many people close the tab after reading that paragraph. Um, and the thing is, even if we publish very long stories, most of the time, most people will drop off, you know, at most of like halfway through an 800 word story anyway. So I think it's, I, I agree that it may, it may well be an issue, and I think, you know, we are working on that, and I think that's going to be a lot of trial and error into that. How do you condense a new story, you know, to that extent? But the issue is that, People don't really read 800 word news stories anyway. They're, yeah, at so, least for so, so is this problem our, that we're audience, losing, we're losing um, sort of nuance, we're losing some of the complexity of the modern world through mm. tweets and, and, uh, and compressing things? I mean, the soundbite problem, I think, has gone on since mm. the, you know, the age of television yeah. and radio. I mean, but it's worse than ever, the, right? It, it, you know, worse than ever is a very relative thing. Okay. I mean, it, you know, I want, I want two things. I don't think that the tweet, the Twitter and Snapchat, I would never, I just don't buy this kind of dumbing down argument that, you know, our, our brains are becoming permanently attenuated in terms of our attention spans. I mean, I'm not an evolutionary biologist, but this doesn't, this doesn't sound plausible to me. Can you capture, like, a, the giantness of, like, the Syria debate in 140 characters? Of course not. Can 140 characters help inspire your curiosity or, or touch your heart or in, inspire you to click on something and then read and learn and come up to your own, make your own decisions? Absolutely, it can do that, and I think it should. I also want to say, George, your generation, the millennials, some of us are hoping that you all will You're come save, no, <laughs> that you all will save the world after the baby boomers have been done have, or finished wrecking it. So thank you. Uh, Peter, are you on Snapchat? No. Um, <laughs> look, look this, is, this is my telephone. Yeah. I, 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 I wouldn't even be able to we'll if I wanted to. No, thank we'll you very you much. No, it's, it, it's uh, okay, there was, there was one down, uh, down here, uh, uh, just here, yeah, lady in the white. Thank you. Um, Susan Howe, Chatham House member. I'm going to have to talk stream of conscious, but I think this is about truth. And when somebody says, when is mainstream journalism going to start telling the truth again? Or how are you going to rebuild the trust that you are telling the truth? I don't understand how we can have this conversation without talking about the degradation of truth in, our, in the media, in our society. I mean, we currently, with all due respect, I think most of you are trying to tell the truth. But we do have some organizations that do not tell the truth, and they do not tell it intentionally. And we have a presidency that's built on an untruth that's perpetrated through some aspects of the media present. For instance, on the, on the dogma that um, Barack Obama was not a US citizen and didn't have a birth certificate. This presidency is built on that lie, which is fake news, which is, I think, the basis for everything we're talking about. So you have people who do not believe, they don't know what's true, mm. because they only, they, they uh, as you discussed, f mm, steal up against untruths and then block. So you have people who only believe untruths. And, ha and so how do you convince them the New York Times is telling you the truth, but 
Breitbart is it, Breitbart is telling the truth, but the New York Times is not because you want to put a label to them. I think this is a huge issue, As, and we have a president who also I don't want to just stand on one side of the the pond, but who also tells untruths, you know, in his tweets in a news conference. To you know, one day, one thing. I mean, yeah. so we have uh, untruth perpetrates our reality. Okay, so I, th I mean, I think that captures some of the conversation that we've had already. Anyone, anyone wants to comment on that specifically, or how do you deal with a president who is uh, saying something that's that's clearly untrue? Well, can I just say that you, you very eloquently proved the point I, I, I made that there are people out there who do actually think that it was fake news that that one that stole the election from Hillary, and I can tell you that half of America disagrees with you. And actually, they look at Obama, and they think he wasn't a shining paragon of truth. And they look at Hillary, and they think she certainly wasn't a shining paragon of truth. I'm not here to defend Trump. I'm just saying that there are alternative points of view out there. And you need media outlets that represent those, those viewpoints. OK, let's just take one more, and then uh, we need to finish, I'm afraid. So um, let's take one over here. Yep. Uyghur Kılıç, member of Chatham House, and I'm a blogger, but I don't write on politics. Uh, I would like to ask, what do you think about the apps like Apple News and artificial intelligence, one, the Quartz.com? Do they change the re reader's mind, or just they are just new apps? Uh, I'm not going to ask you. Uh, I was going to ask Peter, but I think um, so. This is this is uh, these are all things that appear on your on your smartphone if you if you had one. Yeah. So so, <laughs> so are you, sorry. Are you talking about the use of algorithms to kind of help present us? Okay. Yeah. So that's a giant topic. Okay. Yeah. That that could be a whole panel of itself, which you really shouldn't do. <laughs> uh, very succinctly. I think it's a real problem because, I mean, one of the things we haven't had time to talk about tonight is the fact that many people are not coming to any of our websites directly, but they're encountering our content and our articles and our journalism and our commentary through, you know, Facebook. Intermediaries. Through intermediaries. And those intermediaries, as we now know, are serving us what we trained them, what we trained the algorithms to serve us. So that could be information. Sometimes that could be good in so far as the algorithms understand what <laughs> issue areas interest you most. But it can also be really dangerous if it's serving up opinion and kind of you know, if it's just ex if it's just exacerbating the kind of you know information sphere that you live in and not exposing you to other points of view. That is a big problem. That's I a don't very quick point. Yeah, yeah because it was, it was the, the question. It was stated earlier by a question that we were, we were better educated than ever before. I profoundly disagree with this. I think education <laughs> in this country in the Western world has moved away from teaching people how to think to teaching them what to think and the shocking safe spaces and conformity in the universities is a very serious side of that and that is itself another side of the awful conformity uh, which electronic media uh, impose on, on those who are, who are their victims. And the electronic media have become as powerful as they have largely because we have abandoned our children to them at, a, at far too early an age. If your children never walked, then their leg muscles would atrophy. If you never ever give them an opportunity to use their imagination, then their imaginations will atrophy. It is in the imagination that the moral choices of the human race are taken. And if you don't have an imagination, you are an incredibly easy victim for manipulation. And actually, don't blame the media for this. Blame 30 or 40 years of bad education and lazy parenting and refusing to try and do anything about it and to ignore the messages told to us by Neil Postman in Amusing Ourselves to Death many years ago about the dangers of this and T.S. Eliot before that. Don't blame the media for it. It wasn't us that did it. Okay. Uh, Just uh, an extremely quick thing. Tell me. Uh, um, what you're asking about was what I, was, what I started with. This is the echo chamber that the people, the problem that we face right now isn't so much what we are all, all reporting is that the audience is only hearing things they've already agreed with, that the, the algorithms are giving them their own opinion back to them, and they're not being exposed to other, other thought, ways of thinking. And I think that's the issue. So just, just to finish, uh, just one final thought um, to all of you. And uh, if you can keep it to around 30 seconds, that would be ideal. So if we're sitting here in 10, 10 years' time uh, and having this conversation about truth around uh, whether the mainstream media uh, will we still be using terms like mainstream media? Does, uh, does the fourth estate still matter? All in 30 seconds. Uh, James. Um, yeah, I think that um, 
I'm quite optimistic, I, I, yeah. I, and, and I think that what we're going to do in the future is curate our media more. I think maybe bigger organisations, or perhaps some are going to, going to die, and mm -hmm. I think that's probably a good thing, because I think they deserve to die, naming no names. Um, I think people... They're and, not, they're and not here think, to defend yourself, and, and you're running out of time. And I think this polarisation <laughs> is going to, is going to, going to going to continue and it has always been there this polarization it's yeah. you know, Gilbert and Sullivan said everyone every okay. girl and boy that is born alive is either a little liberal or else a little conservative okay time. so we'll still Ever be polarized thus. in uh, in 10 years time Peter yeah. I, I hope I just am able to be here in 10 years time <laughs> <laughs> perfect very very succinct as well thank you Marie no, I I actually agree with James completely with everything he said for the first time this evening, which uh, is slightly odd. We have complete agreement um, on the panel. But yes, no, overall optimism, I think that basically, you know, the internet through this massive thing at the media, and we're still very much figuring it out. And I reckon that we probably will manage to figure so it out. So there's transitional problems, so and the truth will emerge better. Right. Okay. <laughs> um, quickly, I think there will be the expression mainstream media, because I think... Breitbart will never let that nugget go because they just <laughs> love it too much. Should they not be around in 10 They, they might not be around. Um, I can afford them. <laughs> that's, that's great. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I think that we're in a transitional period. I'm actually quite optimistic. I think change is exciting. I think new platforms, new media, new, new voices are all good things. I think there's growth, but growth hurts. Um, in 10 years, will the, and the mainstream term mainstream media doesn't interest me that much. In 10 years, if you're asking if the same set of institutions, including the ones represented in this panel, will exist at all or in the current form, we can, I don't know for sure. Who can? Will the set of journalistic practices that involve fact gathering and presentation of factual information in a fair manner that holds power accountable in service of our democracy, Will that still be around? Well, it had better, because if it doesn't, God help us. It's a great, uh, great note to end on. Thank you very much. Uh, Seal Chan, uh, James uh, Denampole at the end there, Peter Hitchens, uh, uh, Marie LeConte, and uh, Tommy Evans as well. So please put your hands together for our fantastic <laughs>